Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 900 miles away from Prince Edward Island. It's home to the Academy of Natural Sciences, one of the country's oldest natural history museums. Inside is a fantastic collection of original skeletons and casts. The Dinosaur Hall holds 11 different species. Everything from the mighty T-Rex to this impressive Elasmosaurus platyurus. All 13 meters of it. There are so many fossils, not everything could be put on display. And locked in this cabinet lies a connection between this busy American city and Canada's smallest province. It's any day between 270 to 290 million years ago. In this period, PEI is a long way from the coast. It's a hot, dry land filled with strange plants and animals. And not far from this green belt stands one of the strangest of all. As big as a tiger, Bathycnathus borealis is top predator here. His name means deep jaw of the north. The giant sail on his back might have helped heat him up or cool him down, or acted as a display to attract mates. In 180 million years, nature will revisit this design with the giant Spinosaurus. <coughs> <coughs> Millions of years pass in darkness, until 1845 when farmer Donald MacLeod digs up something strange in his new London field. In the heart of Philadelphia remain two chunks of red island sandstone, with a mystery locked inside. A portion of upper jaw a bit of nostril. McLeod knew he'd found something, but he didn't know what. He gave the fossil to Sir John William Dawson, the region's foremost geologist. A little later, both Dawson and his mentor, Sir Charles Lyell, would make a big discovery of a tiny fossil at Joggins. But that's another story. Lyell recommended Dawson's and McLeod's findaway for a thorough study. Even then, it still took a long time to identify. An engraving made at the time shows the skull fragment upside down. The man who commissioned it believed it to be the lower jaw of a dinosaur. He's also remembered as one of the 19th century's greatest experts in comparative anatomy. At the time, he simply didn't have anything else to compare it to. Nothing like it would be found until Dimetrodon fossils emerged from Texas and Oklahoma in the 1870s. Joseph Liety, the father of American vertebrate paleontology. He's responsible for identifying, cataloging, and naming some of North America's most important fossils, including this massive Hadrosaurus. Before that, 
he had a reputation as someone who could take bits of bone and give them a name and a species. Very much the man to call if your well-digging expedition turns up a rock with teeth. Another man with answers is the one who helped find this tectalic fossil in the Canadian Arctic, Academy of Natural Sciences Director Dr. Ted Deschler. He told me more about how a fossil from PEI wound up in Philadelphia. So the fossil has been here for a long time. Leidy wrote about what he called Bathygnathus borealis in 1854. So that was the original scientific description. So um, that was certainly when it, when it was first here and studied. The Academy bought the little fragment, adding it to their growing collection, a collection that today includes over 18 million plant, animal, and fossil specimens. It was already a place with a lot of paleontological collections for comparison, and the guy in charge, Joseph Leidy, was certainly the one who had the most knowledge for comparing and contrasting fossil forms. And so it was only natural that in North America, this would be the place to really make sense out of the fossil that had come from PEI. Both Lyody and Dawson believed the fossil to be a dinosaur jaw. Later, paleontologists identified it as part of a dimetrodon. Dimetrodons have been called mammal-like reptiles. Like mammals, they're synapsids with a single hole behind the eye to help their jaw muscles work. In this way, your own skull isn't all that different from a dimetrodon's. Dinosaurs are diapsids, just like modern crocodiles and birds. Their skulls have two holes behind the eye. Turtles, meanwhile, have absolutely none at all. You know, we used to use the term mammal-like reptile, and that's a bad term. It just is, because it's not a reptile. Um, once you split and you have the synapsids and the diapsids, and this is happening in the Permian period, it's those synapsids that started to experiment with different control of body temperature, different ways of, of, of giving birth, and so forth and so on. Um, and, and Dimetrodon is in that grouping. It's not necessarily on the direct line toward the group that we call mammals today, but it's in that grouping of animals. So it's actually a very important form. Um, it's not particularly closely related to dinosaurs and other things, um, but it is more closely related to us. In 2014, graduate student Kirsten Brink spent a year studying the fossil, this time with a special focus on its teeth. A few years ago, you and some other scientists did a major, some would say definitive, study of the PEI Dimetrodon skull that was found here in 1845. What inspired you and your team to study it? Well, one of the main goals of my PhD research while I was at the University of Toronto was to try and figure out how many species of Dimetrodon there actually are and what the family relationships were between each of those species. So during my studies, I realized that there were certain characteristics of the teeth that helped to distinguish the different species of Dimetrodon. We photographed it and we CT scanned it to see the structure of the teeth on the inside underneath the bone. The structures that we found uh, with the CT scans um, revealed the shape and size of the tooth roots, so the part of the tooth that was sort of hidden underneath the bone. And it showed that the roots were really, really long and really round if you looked at them in cross section. And there's only one other type of dimetrodon, actually one other type of animal in that dimetrodon family that has tooth roots like that. Um, and in combination with the shape of the tooth crown, that's the part of the tooth that sits in the mouth. Um, if these two characters together, both present in the PEI dimetrodon, suggest that it has to be a dimetrodon, the same as all these other dimetrodons that we find in Texas. The Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences published Kirsten's report in November 2015. In it, she revealed something else about the fossil that's not commonly known. The PEI dimetrodon was the second vertebrate fossil named from Canada. So the first fossil was this little amphibian called Dendrophyton. Um, so the fact that it was one of the oldest fossils ever found in Canada, um, and the fact that it's quite large, it's bigger 
than the size of my hand and has really, really nice teeth on it. Um, it's, it's just kind of a charismatic uh, story and piece of Canadian history, which is what sort of attracted me to studying the fossil uh, in addition to the, the science behind it. Lovely as the skull fragment is, I wondered, could the rest of the skeleton still be under that field in New London? I asked Dr. Deschler. We're lucky to have that sample. There's really no way of knowing if there was more of the skeleton preserved at that original discovery site. Um, it's just the nature of paleontology. In fact, it's much more common to find parts of a skeleton, even small fragments of a skeleton, rather than the whole skeleton. So I would say the odds are against finding the rest of the skeleton, but there is a chance that the rest of the skeleton is there. Whether or not the rest of the PEI Dimetrodon ever turns up is a mystery for the future to solve. Meanwhile, in other parts of the island, people still find fossils today, sometimes with intent, often by accident. Scientists and amateurs all have made discoveries, sometimes small, sometimes spectacular, all of them helping fill the gaps in PEI's prehistoric past. So I set out with my camera to track down the fossil hunters, the ones who seek out and find the footprints in the sandstone.